Good evening, good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Renee Battle Brooks, and I'm having technical difficulties. I hope you can still hear me. All right. Yes. Can you still hear me? Oh, we can, Renee. You are having a little bit of difficulty, so I'm going to suggest you unblur your background. Okay. Thank you. I shall do that. I'm sorry about this. It's technical sometimes, and I can jump in, Renee, if you need me to. All right, here we go. None. All right, is that better? Yep, you're good to go. Perfect, thank you. My name is Renee Battlebrooks, and thank you. This is what live looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I am the executive director of the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights. We are the county's civil and human rights education and enforcement agency. Today, our office is officially 50 years and 11 months old. And for the last 11 months, we have been celebrating our 50th anniversary by honoring the legacy of Teresa Douglas Banks, a Prince George's uh, educator, advocate, volunteer, community leader, and civil servant who fought for the formation of our agency back in 1972. We look at her determination, her involvement in so many sectors of the community as a guide and inspiration to our work with the Office of Human Rights, where we are committed to embracing diversity and advancing justice. Tonight, it is our pleasure to join with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System in welcoming Dr. Julia Lee in conversation about her recent book, The Racial Railroad a book which reveals and illustrates the legacy of the train as a microcosm of American culture and race relations in the United States. Despite the seeming supremacy of car culture in the United States, the train has long been and continues to be a potent symbol of American exceptionalism, ingenuity, and vastness. For almost two centuries, the train has served as the literal and symbolic vehicle for American national identity, manifest destiny, and imperial ambitions. Boy, a lot of words that we probably need to unpack. Yeah. It's no surprise then that the train continues to endure in depictions across literature, film, and music. The Racial Railroad highlights the surprisingly central role that the railroad has played and continues to play in the formation and perception of racial identity and differences in the United States. Dr. Lee argues that the train is frequently used as the setting for stories of race because it operates across multiple registers and scales of experience and meaning, both as an innovation of and a depository for all manner of social, historical, and political narratives. So Dr. Julia Lee is a professor and chair of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Irvine, she is the author of Interracial Encounters, Reciprocal Representations in African and Asian American Literatures from 1896 to 1938, and author of Understanding Maxim Hong Kingston. Along with Professor Josephine Lee, Julia is the co-editor of Asian American Literature in Transition, Volume 1, 1850 to 1930. She received her PhD in American literature from UCLA and is a former University of California President's postdoctoral fellow. She teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on Asian American literature, Asian American popular cultures, Korean American experience, Asian American communities, and race and urban space. Co-hosting with me tonight is Kyla Hannington. She is the outreach, Public Outreach and Engagement Division Manager with the Office of Human Rights. And so we welcome both of you. Um, and Dr. Lee, your book is amazing. Um, Thank you. It's academic, but it's amazing. And so we are hoping that you can break that down a little bit for us and share um, some of the highlights and so, some of the things distilled that would be of benefit to those watching. So thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Renee, for that really generous uh, welcome. And um, I'm really delighted to be here with you guys today, virtually, as it were. Um, I want to start by thanking the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights and the Prince George's County Memorial Library System for inviting me to talk today. And I want to thank Kyla and Renee for um, hosting this event. Um, 
Before I start, I just want to um, note that I'm coming to you today from Irvine, California. Um, I know that we're gathering from many locations, but um, I'm sitting on what were the tra what are the traditional homelands of the Achman and Tongva peoples, who, in the face of ongoing settler colonialism, continue to claim their place and act as stewards for their ancestral lands as they have for the past 8,000 years. My purpose in making this land acknowledgement is to ask us to encourage us actually to consider our own roles as settlers and in support indigenous communities wherever you are in their pursuit of justice and recognition. So today's talk um, is based on my book, The Racial Railroad, which was published last year by New York University Press. And I'm going to uh, I'm just going to provide like a summary of the book overall, um, and then I'm going to share some kind of key moments. So I have a promise, I'm making a promise to you, the viewer. Uh, I promise to keep my remarks short, <laughs> about maybe 20 minutes or so. And I'm gonna share a lot of images as well, um, things that we can take a look at together. And then I'm really looking forward to the conversation or questions afterwards. Um, so I welcome any questions about the book or my research or anything like that. So thank you. So let me start, can I start my slideshow? Okay. Thank you. All right. So that is my that's my contact information as well. If you have questions afterwards, you can always find me um, on the UCI website. OK, so if I were to ask us to sit here and name works of literature, films, television shows, songs, paintings, photographs that depict or are set on the train, the list would be enormous. The railroad is ubiquitous in American culture, and the reasons for that aren't actually what we might think. We might chalk up the frequent appearance of the railroad in the mid 19th century to the train's relative novelty as a technology at that time, because of course the train wasn't introduced in the United States really until the mid 19th century. Um, likewise, the train's omnipresence in the works of the early 20th century might be a function of its ubiquity in an era that was known as the golden age of railroad travel. If we were to try to correlate cultural representations of the train to actual rail ridership, one might expect that stories about the railroad would have petered out um, in about the early to mid 20th century when the automobile and airplane travel took over. But that hasn't been the case. Despite the fact that most people uh, have nothing to do with railroads in their everyday lives, trains continue to pop up with surprising frequency in our cultural landscape. The train's absence in our daily lives and omnipresence representationally suggests that it has served and continues to serve a purpose that goes beyond transportation. So that's one of the things that my book is interested in. Why is it that we are we look to the train to explain so much about American culture. Why is that? The answer that I come up with in, in the book is the train is everywhere because of its ability to tell a story. And there is no greater story that continues to dominate and haunt this nation than the story of race. The racial railroad argues that the train has been a persistent and crucial site for racial meaning making in American culture for the past 150 years. Now, what do I mean when I say that? I mean that Americans often look to the train as a way of working out the meaning of race in the United States. There is something about the train in its history, in its construction, in the way that it divides space that brings into stark relief questions of racial identity, difference, or conflict. So more than any other space or technology or symbol, the train offers us a way to think about race across lots of scales of experience and meaning. As a symbol of manifest destiny and of the nation's unity and vastness, the train exemplifies US exceptionalism. As an instrument for dislocating native populations and opening the West, the Pacific and Asia to American settlement and trade, the train carries and carries out the nation's settler and imperial ambitions. As a technological feat that standardized time produced wealth and enabled the rapid movement of goods, capital and people, it serves as a, pro pro a proxy, excuse me, for private industry and the state. As a place that is often an overlooked part of our built environment, it typifies the quotidian and the material. As a space in which people from all walks of life interact with each other in confined quarters, it is intersectional and dynamic. 
So despite the rhetoric of freedom and ingenuity that is often attached to the railroad in US history, trains have played an important role in justifying settler colonialism and racist hierarchies, as well as in carrying out policies related to those ideologies. Railroads were used to displace and exterminate Native American populations. Chinese and Mexican laborers were exploited throughout the 19th and 20th centuries in order to lay down track in the West and Southwest. The train was the setting for Plessy versus Ferguson, which was the 1896 Supreme Court case that made segregation the law of the land. And it was overturned in, the, in 1954 by Brown versus Board of Education. It was on the very cars that they could not ride as passengers that thousands of African-American men and women worked as porters, maids, and waitstaff. Rail technologies have enabled the efficient transport of prisoners and the deportation of migrants. However, at the same time that the train has been an instrument of all of this kind of disenfranchisement and violence, it is also deeply embedded in the psyches and stories of many communities. And that is what my book focuses on, how artists and writers who identify as African-American, Asian-American, Native American, or Latin, Latina, Latino represent the railroad. So now I'm gonna walk you through some of the examples um, I examined in my book. And the screen in front of you shows my table of contents with a little bit of a blurb um, explaining each chapter. So my first chapter examines an eclectic array of visual works from the mid 19th century through the 21st centuries that imagine the train as a tool of settler colonialism. So I look at 19th century landscape paintings by, this is John Gast, it's called American Progress. Uh, this is called Across the Content, uh, Continent, excuse me, Westward the Course of Empire Makes Its Way. And this is by the artist Francis Flora Bond Palmer, um, who worked in the workshop of Courier Knives. I also look at early 20th century travel ad advertisements from, this is a, an example of an ad from the Atchison, Topeka and Santa Fe Railroads. Excuse me. And the Northern Pacific Railroad. Um, and this is an advertisement from the Northern Pacific Railroad um, advertising um, their line to, um, uh, to the West, through the West. All of these images either erase the influence and presence of Native Americans on the lands of the frontier in the case of the landscape paintings, or commodify the Indian by conflating the figure with the land and the train itself. So if you look at this image, for example, the body of this um, figure is actually the land upon which the railroad tracks are running. The erasure and then commodification of the native figure to justify their removal and the exceptional relationship between the US and the lands that it occupies um, today is a mark of, of what I study in this chapter. And I argue that it also lingers into the, into the 21st century. So to prove that point, um, I, I wanted to share with you, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna be able to see, see it actually, but I, I, I think Kyla is gonna share a link um, for this video. Uh, I'm gonna share with you the 21st, uh, 21st century production reel for Jerry Bruckheimer Films. Um, which is merely the latest in a long line of visual works that use the train as a way of representing the desolation of lands, supposed desolation of lands that were already occupied. So this clip appears before the first trailer for the 2013 film, The Lone Ranger, directed by Gore Vidal and starring Johnny Depp and Army Hammer. So if you go look at that clip, you'll see at the beginning some of the images and it'll end with this image that you see in front of you. I'm just gonna just, this is the beginning of the, the trailer. Um, the Lone Ranger was produced, I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. It is not a great work of cinema, I'll just say that. Although I think it's very interesting. Um, the Lone Ranger was produced in partnership with Walt Disney Studios. So the reel, when you go take a look at it, opens with perhaps the most recognizable corporate logo in Western cinema, Sleeping Beauty's castle surrounded by an arc of fairy dust with the stylized signature of Walt emblazoned across the top, the bottom of the screen. We are all familiar with that image. The camera zooms in and Sleeping Beauty's castle seamlessly becomes um, Say Bit I, which is known in English as Shiprock, uh, see, creating a seeming equivalence between those two um, icons, right? This seeming movement between the two sites, between Sleeping Beauty's castle and um, Shiprock, 
uh, show how easily and extensively Navajo and by extension Native American spaces are incorporated in the service of national and global imperial economies. The logo reel depicts the railroad as roaring through Shiprock, which is of course inaccurate because Shiprock um, is, does not have a train tunnel running through it. It is one of the most sacred sites of the Navajo Nation and it's not accessible um, to tourists or outsiders. Um, However, the fact that it features so prominently in a production logo trumpeting the creative powers of Hollywood is very instructive. My point is that our imaginative lives are saturated with this concept that the train creates the nation. What is noteworthy is how ordinary this association has become, so much so that the image of a train barreling through the religious grounds of a Native American reservation becomes an example of American exceptionalism. The production reel makes clear that where once there was nothing, the railroad brought forth life. So I also examined in this chapter two works that I argue resist this kind of easy equation between railroad and nation. And the first is another film, and that is Bong Joon-ho's 2013 film, Snowpiercer, um, starring Captain America himself, Chris Evans. And then this is another image from Snowpiercer. And I talk about this film extensively in my book. And then um, a Native American artist named Jack Fragua, whose graffiti on a train ser uh, series resists the kind of spatializing and settler colonial logics that the railroad imposes. So he actually graffitis native design like this. You can see it's called a one-liner. He calls them one-liners on freight trains um, as they're paused in their, in their travels. Fragua, who is a member of the Jemez Pueblo, uses the train in his art installations to refute the erasure of the Native American figure, specifically in works like Untitled uh, 2012, Untitled 2015, and Stop Coal. Fragua graffitis freight cars with Native designs to resist the erasure of Native American communities and the conflation of the Indian with landscape. So he uses what we call a space-centered epistemology to assert a different kind of relationship between native and land. One that is not commercialized um, as it is in the, the Bruckheimer, the film reel, but that nevertheless recognizes the long lasting impact of settler incursions upon the land. So the racial railroad also examines the significance of the transcontinental railroad in contemporary Chinese American culture. So Asian American and Asian uh, Canadian writers and historians have frequently looked the labor of the Chinese workers on the transcontinental and the Canadian Pacific Railway to imagine their places within nations that, we, that have traditionally viewed them as intrinsically foreign. Its popularity, the popularity of the railroad in Chinese American culture is no doubt attributable to the central and complicated place that the railroad, particularly the transcontinental railroad occupies in the Asian American imaginary. Central of course, because Chinese laborers played such an indispensable role in its construction and complicated because those contributions have generally been erased or ignored. Um, so this is a stereograph card at the Huntington Library in Pasadena with a photograph by Alfred Hart, who was hired by the Central Pacific Railroad to document the construction of the railroad. So he was not charged specifically with photographing Chinese railroad workers, but because he was um, the official photographer of the Central Pacific, he inevitably took many photos of uh, Chinese railroad workers, all of them anonymous. We, their names have been lost to history. So the railroad stands as a monument to the labor and ingenuity of thousands of Chinese workers. It's also a manifestation of the economic exploitation that they endured because they were paid much less than their um, white counterparts. And as this quotation from Sky Lee's novel, Disappearing Moon Camp Face suggests, the railroad is also an unmarked grave for an untold number of men who died in the shadow of the railroad. So in the book, I look at Chinese American writers like Max and Hong Kingston, Brian Lung, Peter Ho Davies, Sky Lee, Frank Chin, Lisa C, C. Pam Zhang, David Henry Wong. Um, they've all made the railroad an important part of their kind of fictional and dramatic imaginings. And I'm particularly interested in these three authors who are perhaps the best known of, of, of them um, and argue that they construct, they view the railroad as a form of text. Um, one that they can read or narrate in order to sort of make visible again the erasure of Chinese American life and experience in the United States. So their works offer the railroad 
as a key for understanding Chinese Americans, right? And also as a strategy for narrating Chinese American experience in the face of marginalization. So I'm happy to talk more about this. I'm leaving out a lot of obviously background story and close readings, but I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q and A. Um, this is also part of the book, right? So the, the political project of reminding the nation of that which it would like to forget, right? Can also be found in Chinese American attempts to reenact certain key moments in the construction of the transcontinental. So the image in front of you now is perhaps one of the most famous moments. It's definitely one of the most famous photographs in 19th century America. This is often called the champagne photo. And it is the moment um, the transcontinental railroad was completed in Promontory Summit, Utah um, in 1869. Uh, and this photograph is famous. Um, uh, precisely because it marks that that moment, but of course, no Chinese railroad workers are included in the image, um, even though about three quarters, twelve out of the fifteen thousand workers that worked for the Central Pacific Railroad, about twelve thousand of them were Chinese, um, but no Chinese were were included in this photograph. So what is interesting is that there is a group of Chinese Americans. Um, many of them who are descendants of the railroad workers who gather annually at Promontory Summit um, in order to reenact that photograph um, from the perspective, obviously including China. It's the image in this, you can see it's all Chinese Americans uh, or Asian Americans. Um, and so the idea is to kind of re rethink that originary, what that supposedly originary moment, right? that moment that is often been called like a, a, a landmark in American history, right? Um, and to sort of reimagine it from the perspective of Chinese Americans as this photograph does. Um, let me see. So, sorry, I just got lost in my own paperwork here. Um, so this image is the cover of the book. Um, and it is by a African-American artist named Jack, Jacob Lawrence. It's part of his migration series. And um, this is my segue into, into talking about how the railroad has played such a huge role in African-American culture. So it is not an exaggeration to say that the train is really a central theme in the African in African-American cultural imaginings. So it is a metaphor, first of all, so I'm gonna list a bunch of ways in which this is true, I think. It is a metaphor for illicit black movement, illegal black movement, um, the under, for example, the Underground Railroad in the 19th century, right? Which is the metaphor that enslaved people used uh, to talk about trying to escape slavery. Um, it is also a metaphor for black dance, Soul Train from the 19, from the middle of the 20th century. Um, it, is a, it is a symbol of segregation, uh, the Jim Crow car. And it is also a symbol of love thwarted or lost in countless blues songs um, from the early to mid 20th century. It's a sign of upward social mobility um, because Pullman porters and Pullman maids, those were often the most economically secure jobs um, that African-American men and women could uh, get in the early 20th century during the era of Jim Crow. And it's also a symbol of freedom. Um, the greatest internal um, migration in the nation's history was the Great Migration, right, which is the period from the late 19th century to the early 20th century when many African Americans rode the railroad out of the South, um, north to Chicago or out west or up, up to New York. So um, historian John Insko calls train travel the central and, dr and um, dramatic aspect of Southern Black life. And indeed, if you read late 19th century and early 20th century African-American literature, it is filled with stories about railroad travel, uh, especially because trains so often served in these narratives as the setting for the first or most la lasting encounters with racism. Historian Barbara Welk argues that one of the defining characteristics of Jim Crow is the complete resistance of whites to the very idea of yielding any space in public to blacks. So African-American narratives of the Jim Crow train tend to focus on that very subject, the ways that riding the train um, disciplines or erases uh, African-American subjects. So if African-American writers re represent the train as a space that is generally hostile to black movement, then African-American singers um, and composers tend to portray the train as enabling black movement, one that works to 
um, free black subjects from the racism that often defines them as invisible. So that movement is often couched in the language of romantic heartache. That's why it's called the blues. Uh, but the train ride sig that signals the end of a romantic relationship is not a train ride about white supremacy or fleeing white supremacy. So as I said, this painting is by Jacob Lawrence and is titled The Trains Were Crowded with Migrants, uh, which is part of his migration series. And then in the book, I also talk about, and I encourage you to Google or to find out more information about these artists. Um, this is Elizabeth Cotton. Um, and she was an African-American folk singer whose best known song is Freight Train. Um, and again, you can find her performing this song on YouTube. She released her first album in her mid sixties. So there's hope for all of us. Um, Cotton was a self-taught guitarist. Um, and although she composed mo songs for almost her entire life, uh, as I said, her first album wasn't released until she was in her 60s. And the song Freight Train expresses a desire to ride a freight car that runs so fast. And she warns the listener, she tells the listener, don't tell anyone where I'm going, right? That wish to be highly mobile and also unfindable um, is also found in this more famous blues song. Um, this is Gertrude Ma Rainey's performance of Traveling Blues. Um, which is a standard in the blues canon. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard it. Again, I encourage you to, to Google or to look on YouTube for, for this. So the book also examines um, the role of the Underground Railroad in US history and African-American culture. Uh, so this is of course, Harriet Tubman, who was the most famous conductor on the Underground Railroad. And who once said, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years and I can say what most conductors can't I never ran, ran my train off the track and I never lost a passenger. So the use of the railroad as a metaphor for black freedom in the antebellum era is particularly striking when one considers the fact that most enslaved people living in the South would probably have never ridden a train um, or even seen one because trains were not as prevalent in the American South in the antebellum era as they were in the North. Um, so it's striking that it was still used as a metaphor for freedom, even though, again, it wasn't part of their experiential everyday life. I also examine um, Colson Whitehead's 2016 Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Underground Railroad. Again, this novel is, is really wonderful. It's devastating. Um, so I encourage you to read it if you haven't already. In the novel, and some of you may know this, the Underground Railroad isn't a metaphor, um, it's a material reality. So the novel follows the protagonist Cora as she tries to escape the South, taking actually these cars, these train tracks that are built underground. Um, so in literalizing the railroad, Whitehead works to imagine black spaces or black mobility, again, outside of the constraints of kind of white supremacy or racism. And last but not least, the racial railroad considers the train as a mobile prison, as a space that makes clear that mobility and carcerality, which we usually think of as being opposites, are rather two sides of the same coin. So one of the ways we can see this is through La Bestia, or the Beast, uh, which is a network of freight trains that 400,000 migrants from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador ride northward annually uh, through Mexico to reach um, the US southern border. So you may remember that the migrant trains were in the news in 2018 uh, because they were the focus of, of then President Trump's anger. Um, but in the book, I look at, and this is an image from um, a photographer, these are migrants, this is how they often ride. They ride on top or they ride the blind, which is the space between train cars, between railroad cars. So in the book, I look at actually um, a music video um, called Immigrants We Get the Job Done, which um, came out in 2017 and was directed by Tomas Whitmore, which imagines migrant life as set on a freight train. So immigrants, we get the job done. You, some of you may recognize as a line from Hamilton, the musical. Um, and this is, this is from the Hamilton mixtape. So Lin-Manuel Miranda um, is, a, is credited as a, as a co-writer for this song and he does not appear in the video. So again, I encourage you to Google it. Um, you will see David Diggs at the end of it. Um, but this uh, video illustrates how the fundamental condition of the migrant is carceral mobility, so an imprisoned mobility, um, a mobility that is controlled or disciplined without the need for physical imprisonment. Okay. 
So this interplay between the carceral and the mobile can be seen in the lyrics for Immigrants We Get the Job Done and in the embodied performances of the four rappers, uh, Kanan, Snow the Product, uh, Riz MC and Residente, as well as in the mobile framing. So in the camera work that highlights the notion of carceral mobility that, that Whitmore is interested in. So as I hope these brief readings have indicated, the railroad is everywhere. Um, alas, I cannot account for all of the examples within the confines of a single book. So I started this task, at, or this talk, excuse me, asking us to think about works that link the race, link race and the railroad. And as I conclude, I'd like to return to that imagined list to acknowledge the stories that do not appear in my book. So I don't talk about Native Americans or Chicana Chicano literary re representations of the railroad in writers such as Zick Lassa, Leslie Marmon Silco, or Maurice Ruiz de Burton. I'm silent on the use of the train in the evacuation and incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II, the Bracero program that brought Mexican workers into the U.S. during that same period, and the hiring of Navajo men as track men by the ATSF by the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe starting in the 19th century. I don't talk about hoboing, which is an important part of 20th century labor and migration history. I don't talk about John Henry, um, the famous African-American folk figure, or historical events like the unjust arrest and imprisonment of the Scottsboro Nine. Films such as Carrie Joji Fukunaga's uh, Sin Nombre, which chronicles the journey of a Honduran girl and a Mexican gang member on La Bestia is also not in my book. Neither are these mega uh, films, Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable, Talks Unstoppable, Barry Sonnenfeld's Wild Wild West, or TV shows like AMC's Hell on Wheels, or WGN, the WGN uh, Network's Underground. These did not make the cut. So I'm sure there are dozens more examples that I'm not thinking of or have never heard of. Um, but at any rate, the list of works that could have been included in this book goes on and on. And that's actually an important point for me. Anyone with even the most elementary knowledge or grasp of American culture will be able to identify works that should have been included uh, because that is how pervasive uh, the railroad and race um, is. I can only ask that readers take up that gap and think about examples themselves um, from their own experiences. Um, yeah, and so I'm gonna conclude there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. That, that was, was really, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kyla. Yeah. I was gonna say what you were gonna say, which was that that was a great, uh, absolutely great presentation. Oh, thank um, you. I, I will say I have a lot of questions that I've, I, I, I love that some of the questions, like I, and I'm gonna get there. Like I, I have a question specifically about the images that you showed, the gas painting and Palmer's lithograph. So we're gonna yes. go back there. But I do wanna start by saying we got a question from one of our viewers. And so for people who are watching, please type any questions that you have into the chat wherever you're watching, we'll share them as we can with um, Julia and really try and get answers to you and engage you in this discussion. So we did get a question really early on from, from one of our um, faithful participants, uh, Ms. Vivian, who's really wondering why you wrote the book. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I wrote the book actually because, I mean, as an academic, as a professor, you are expected to write books. I mean, you're supposed to be doing research and maintaining a research profile. And I have always been interested in kind of interracial or multiracial um, encounters and how writers imagine that kind of you know, that kind of encounter between people from different races. Um, and my, my specialty actually in graduate school was the early 20th century. Um, and if you read any American literature from the early 20th century, the train is everywhere. And I just began to realize there are a lot of examples actually of black writers, Asian, Asian American writers and African American writers talking about the railroad. Um, and then it just, it started, I'm, you know, as, um, as, uh, was said previously, I, my PhD is in American literature, but this book isn't really a literary analysis only. Um, and so I began to realize as I was writing the book, well, there's a lot of material out there in photographs and in films. And every time I gave a talk, someone else, uh, someone in the audience would say, oh, have you seen this? Like, did you, did you think of this? Um, and so it eventually became just, it, it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, and as someone, you know, I also loved trains growing up. We had, we have a model train that runs around the base of our Christmas tree. Like um, my father was a very, was an amateur rail hobbyist. So we had like a train setup, a model train setup in our basement. Um, 
And so it's it's something there is a level of kind of nostalgia um, that I think Americans, a lot of Americans feel toward the railroad, even if they themselves did not ever ride trains growing up. Um, and so I think, it, you know, for a lot of reasons, it's it's interesting. It's really interesting in terms of scholarship, in terms of history, in terms of literature, in terms of culture. And then, of course, like everybody loves a train, like everybody loves a train ride. Um, and so for those reasons, I think. Um, that's why I kind of wrote the book. I didn't start out actually with this topic. It just kind of, it, it morphed into this as time went on. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you for that answer. And, and Renee, are you okay if I go with my question about the images and then I'll- oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so I did, and I can actually put this back up and show just very yeah. quickly the viewers. Um, so I, I'll do that. I'll handle the slideshow. I just want to say that I was very interested in your insight into imagery and these two images. So I'm going to put them up. Yeah. Uh, really quickly, just so that people who are looking at this, sorry for going backwards, everybody, um, can see what I'm talking about. These two, these two images, and so, so J Julie, you talk about them in the book, and you you notice that the train as civil as civilizer, and yeah. you use this image, and then this other, and I'll show them both. But this image where you've got the, you know, and you talk about, you really do a wonderful job of describing it in the book, where you've got the the light from yes. the east. You know where the train from whence the train comes mm -hmm. uh, as a civilizing force and the the darkness um the west you know which is yet to be civilized by the train right. is in darkness and right. um and then in this image you sort of show the same thing where you've got this mm -hmm. the civilization um on one side and then this kind of landscape that must be civilized in this play of light and dark mm -hmm. there so i'll take this down but i wanted to be able to show the viewers what we were yeah. talking yeah. about there and i was just really if you can talk about like more like like when i read this and i was reading the descriptions and i was thinking about you as a writer um and a scholar think how did you to come to this because very clear when i saw it written i would mm -hmm. like to know your journey to those images yeah so i'm not like an art historian or anything by training so i was i mean i'd seen the the lithograph um the westward across the you know the the one the second image that you show that is perhaps the most famous lithograph in u.s history a copy of it sold with the highest it was sold at sotheby's or it was sold at auction a few years ago it's the highest amount that was ever paid for a lithograph um ever so lithographs are matte like kind of they're produced a lot so it was very it was telling to me that this is an image that has a lot of value like kind of economic value as well as cultural currency um but basically there is a whole genre of painting in the 19th century which is kind of um u.s landscape painting which, which is all about portraying the kind of the majesty of the nation, right? As the nation is being settled, um, these painters are showing, um, you know, how it is that the U.S. is going to settle and develop and civilize and make the land productive, right? Um, mm -hmm. Make the land. That is actually a huge part of it. Is it isn't just civilization? It's that farming comes in and transportation and shipping and all of these things. And there's a perception in the 19th century and it's everywhere in the 19th century that Native Americans are not using the land. Right. Right. Um, they don't use the land correctly. They don't farm it. They don't extract from it. So they don't own it, right? They can't own it if they are not using it. Um, and so this is a, these are very common tropes. So I actually have more examples that I talk about in the book. Um, I couldn't include all the images, but, 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 um, but yeah, it's a very common kind of thing in 19th century landscape painting. Um, and you'll often see in those paintings, which I, which I talk about, it's interesting to me, the native, there are native figures in those paintings, but they're pushed to the side. Um, in the second one, they're about to be, you know, uh, covered in with the gray smoke emanating from um, the locomotive train, right? And in the second one, they're all moving, like they're running hurriedly, like off the frame. So it's showing the process, right? It's interesting because it's not, the land isn't empty, it is inhabited, right? The paintings show that, um, but it's showing also like the justification for why Native Americans need to be pushed off the land. Right. Right. Um, and I think that's, a, that's telling, right? That's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Renee. Yeah. Yeah, kind of to piggy piggyback onto that when we're talking about symbolism, and I and I love the way you describe or analyze the pictures and how it's really, um, you know, looking peering into yeah. the soul of who right. we were and, right. and still are as Americans. Yeah, right? yeah, that hasn't really changed in a couple hundred years. Some, yeah. some of that yeah. core, right? Um. And, and then I was thinking about, you talked about the symbolism of 
you know, what the train represents to a lot, right? The nostalgia. And I was kind of reflecting that it also represents sort of peace and tranquility and mm -hmm. comfort. Mm -hmm. But in actuality, none of that is, I mean, you know, when you, when you really know the history and really, right. right? Yeah. And, and then, so I'll get to my point. <laughs> so, Fine. No, I, I enjoy listening to this. You're absolutely right. Go on, please. Right. And so I, I was uh, struck by, you know, the, the picture there um, and the erasure mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the contributors of this, you know, we call American exceptionalism. That's a whole different discussion, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, then I, I'm thinking about juxtaposing that with today. Yeah. And how we are in the same paradigm with the erasure of history or the mm -hmm. attempt or the rewriting of history. Sure. And, and I, if you could just unpack that, I mean, most of our viewers probably understand that, but, yeah. you know, and, and it may be obvious why erasure, where erasure comes from and why mm -hmm. it's so important that we acknowledge and we keep this from happening. Can mm -hmm. you just... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this is a, a hallmark of, of the, it's not just the US, right? And it's not just in the 21st century. This is a hallmark of kind of American history, just generally speaking, mm -hmm. um, where there is a tendency to minimize or undermine the kind of contributions, right? Or the presence even mm -hmm. of native populations, black people, right, Asians, um, in the kind of the, the, the formation of the country and um, its rise to kind of global ascendance in the late 19th century, right? Um, and so what I think is really striking is the way um, that, uh, that kind of writers and artists attempt to remind, right, viewers um, or their readers about this history, right? Um, that isn't being taught by and large, right? So the, the image of um, the reenactment, right? The, the kind of the ways in which on a very small scale, right? On a community-based scale, mm -hmm. um, those descendants of Chinese railroad workers are attempting to remind the nation, but also like themselves, right? That this is a community, that this is a connection that um, they have to the past, to a history. Um, that they really don't have access to. So I've given this talk, I've given versions of this talk to, let's say, the Chinese, uh, at the Chinese American Museum here in Los Angeles. And what was really striking, I spoke with so many people afterwards, um, who told me afterwards, oh, I, I, you know, my family has been in this country for three or four generations. I've heard that my uncle or my great uncle or my grandfather, like he worked on the railroad, but they have no they have no like kind of archive, they have no, they only have heard stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this is a common theme for a lot of um, folks who are, who belong to racial minoritized groups, right? There is like, that's not, archives don't save that kind of information. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so it is really, I mean, it's a moment of sadness on their part, right? I, I don't know, like, how do I, they, they come up to me and they're like, how do I find out? Like, what archive do I need to look at? Mm -hmm. and it's, it's really, it's, it's awful, but like the Central Pacific, they did not, they did not keep the names of the men who were working for them by and large, right? They wrote down their wages. There's no way to standardize Chinese names or there was no attempt to standardize Chinese names in the 19th century. So even if we have those names, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's no place to go to or no book or no record to go to where we can, we can find that history, right? And so that's why I think the railroad is so important in these you know, cultural traditions because you can't go to a museum or you can't go to a library to find this stuff. So it is artists and writers and historians who are attempting to recreate this or kind of reimagine what this must have been like while acknowledging that, of course, they, they don't have access to that anymore. So, you know, I think it, you know, there is a constant erasure of history uh, in the U.S. It's History is hotly contested um, in the U.S. Uh, it's ironic to me because, you know, um, we hear about history dying as a profession or we hear about students not majoring in history. We hear about that on our campus and across college campuses. And yet history is like one of the most contested ideas, right? What is the purpose of history? Uh, what are we supposed to learn from history? Um, and so I think what's important is that people these artists and these writers and these folks are imagining that history for themselves, right? Um, rebuilding that history for themselves. 
Yeah, I, and I'm sorry, Kali, just one thing. I was struck also during your presentation about sort of this, um, and let me see if I can find the exact words, but um, the railroad as a um, sort of burial site. That was yeah. gripping. Yes. Um, unmarked. And and at the I'll, I'll give you a little bit of time to reflect, and at the end I'll come back, but you know, what is something practical that we as Americans, we as caring people about, what can we do to elevate that to, you know, why isn't there a monument? Why can't we, it, mm. anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that because we always like to leave our listeners and viewers with something practical maybe that they can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll circle back to that for sure. But Kyla? Well, I was going to say for the people who are watching, I've been putting links in the chat for the whole conversation. And I actually just put a link in the chat about a conversation we had last year on the book History Disrupted, which is just about this whole, uh, and I put it in the chat, feel free to check it out. But it is this, you know, this content, I mean, it's like a constant negotiation and a ratio. I'm a history, I, I'm from Canada. I did my degree in history, my undergrad degree is in First Nation Studies. Mm -hmm. and so this is not an area, and of course in Canada as well, the the railroad is nation builder. Right. And, uh, nation, sorry, heavy quotes nation builder yeah. um, and with the same story of the erasure of people who were you know ex did and continue to exist mm -hmm. on the land as part of it's kind of a fundamental part of our story but as much as that's true as i was reading your book i found myself um remembering with a kind of um chagrin or 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 embarrassment um Maybe like two weeks ago, a news story came out that CPR, Canadian Pacific Railway, just if you're from Canada, you know the CPR, that they've just joined uh, with Kansas and they have a new name. They're not the CPR anymore. They're like K, I should Google this before I say it on YouTube, CPKC, I think, Can Canadian Pacific, Kansas City. And so mm -hmm. what, my point is to say, I found myself being really mad, mm -hmm. like, that, like that they had, that they, being the Canadian Pacific Railroad, had somehow sold me out by like changing their name and joining with Americans. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this as a history major, first nation right. studies minor, someone who's very aware of these stories does not feel like I absorb and, and, or just um, thoughtlessly absorb nation building myths and identity. And so mm -hmm. as I read this, I was like, oh, it's a little uncomfortable to realize how much the railroad and those ideas still are, are so firmly inside my, my, my vision mm -hmm. and I was thinking like, I'm sorry, I'm now I'm talking too much, but I did want to talk about this idea of, of how, how deeply embedded it is in the national side. I'm, you know, obviously I'm a white person, I'm a white Canadian, but well, for this, for the sake of this conversation, we'll say that I'm a white American. And mm -hmm. so my, I'm going to have a different experience mm -hmm. than the racialized groups that are, that you describe. But mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, do you think that this is a collective that sort of all of us as Americans just cannot get away from that rhetoric or that uh, idea? I, I think, yeah. I mean, partly I'm like, that's what I argue in the book. It's like deeply embedded. Like, so even my parents immigrated, I immigrated here when I was two. I have no familial, personal connection to the railroad at all. I think I've been on a train maybe a half a dozen times in my life. And yet I too, you know, I did a lot of research looking at tra the travel industry um, and how the railroad really was the beginning of um, like leisure travel, like leisure travel advertising. And a lot of it, the rhetoric around railroad travel is to see the nation the way it's meant to be seen, right? From mm -hmm. the ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, and pre-COVID, I don't know if these places have bounced back, but you could take these kinds of nostalgia train rides, right? Um, and you could do it on Amtrak still, right? But these were trains, these are often luxury travel, you know, um, companies, and you could see, like see the West in particular, right, the way it was meant to be seen. So it is, and I find those, ad, I find that incredibly appealing. Yeah, that I, I, that sounds like a lot of fun. Like that sounds like the seeing the country the way it should be, right? Um, and so I think that is, but I, I, and I argue that's what makes the train so powerful is, and it's so weird. So um, that you may not have much historical or long familial connections and that doesn't matter because it's so pervasive mm -hmm. in the culture. It's so it's everywhere um, that you, you just absorb it without realizing it. So part of my work that I like to think about doing as a teacher and a, as a researcher is to actually make people stop and think about 
those things that they don't tend to think about or just assume, right? Um, and so, and the train is one of them. Like I bet many of you travel over train tracks every day, right? Or like mm -hmm. annoyed that the, the arm comes down and you have to sit there and wait in your truck. But why are there train tracks there? Like what historically, like what was transported over those lines? Um, why does the train come through the neighborhoods that it does, right? At that, mm -hmm. those locations. Um, and so when you're telling the story of the railroad, you're telling the story of the country, the good, right? And the, the awful, right? right. Um, and I think that's important too. And it, you know, in many ways, I think the U.S. has this particular relationship to the railroad because it's a sign of, you know, as the U.S. was beginning its ascent globally, right? It was a sign of kind of American ingenuity. It was like it's considered the Transcontinental Railroad is considered one of the greatest infrastructural projects, right, in U.S. history. Um, and so it was a big deal, right? And so that kind of notion that the train is a big deal continues, um, mm -hmm. and it's it's pervasive, like I said. As as you were saying that, I was actually reflecting when you said, like, why do we ask ourselves when right. the arm is down? Why is it here? And, and I was right. thinking that, you know, some of the phrases we say, oh, that person's born on the wrong side of the railroad. That's right. Here. That's right. right. The wrong side of the tracks. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and, and we, it, when you look at sort of the neighborhoods that train or railroads go through, it's never the wealthy. Right. 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 And so it kind of further symbolizes mm -hmm. and in this very real visceral way shows us that mm -hmm. you know we, we talk about sort of redlining and some of these other issues yeah. that, right and and um uh in your bio right how s cities are built and why and where and mm -hmm. just the racialization of that and how right. i mean it, it it all is uh it just all encompassing, just as you said, but that just yeah. that one little thing made me, yeah. made me think about that. Yeah. Um, you said in your presentation that, you know, tell, tell us some backstories or background stories that, yeah. that uh, yeah, something that a nugget that uh, will stick with. Some of yeah. Those. Yeah. Actually, just as you were talking, I, I remembered, you know, how when I talk about like the kind of pervasiveness of the train, mm -hmm. um, I talk about this in the book a little bit. There've been a couple of film scholars that have talked about this, but basically the railroad became super really popular in the 19th century at the same time that film, right? Um, also um, entered the kind of, you know, became a, a very, you know, widespread form of like media, right? Um, so people have like the kind of, the way we even perceive the world um, is a reflection of train travel. Um, and so, when we think about what riding the train must have been like, and there's a there's a um, historian Wolfgang Schivelbusch who talks about this. Um, he says, imagine that you've never traveled faster than a horse could carry you, right? Which would be mm -hmm. 10, 15 miles, right? As fast as the fastest you've ever moved in your life is how fast you walk, right, or run, or how fast you can, how fast the horse you have runs. And then imagine getting on a train and you're going 30 miles an hour, like 40 mm -hmm. miles. Right for the first time in in human history, right, mm -hmm. um, and the way in which the train then introduced subjects to this idea of life at speed, right. So as opposed to I can only go so far as my feet will carry me. Now I can go to places that I could never have imagined before, um, and the film film is the same thing, right. Um, and so so much of the vocabulary around film, like the follow shot or tracking shots, actually are because of the railroad, because mm -hmm. these two technologies, mm -hmm. so the first films were of trains. Um, I talk about in the book, they they used to strap cameras onto the cow catchers of trains and just film the train moving. And people were fascinated by that, right? In the, in the late 19th century, um, because it imitated the idea. If you, you know, if you have like cameras that are GoPro cameras and you see on YouTube, like people racing down mountains on their bikes or whatever, it's the same kind of thing, right? It's this idea that um, the train in conjunction with film um, introduces us to this idea that life can be lived at a faster rate of speed or that we can go faster than we ever imagined before. Um, and that's what technology often does. And the train was this kind of amazing form of technology, right? Um, and so when I say it's pervasive, like I really mean it. Like even the way we perceive our bodies in space, the way we perceive film, it's because of the way, because of what the train has done, right? That, that those paths were opened up because the train introduced the idea of speed 
um, into, into our sort of experiential being. Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I find it really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Like that's something that we don't ride, that we don't think about, right. Um, has had such a profound impact on how we see ourselves, how we perceive others. Um, and it's not remarked upon right in our daily lives. Um, mm -hmm. I think is really interesting. Yeah, kind of, as both of you have said, it's kind of just absorbed through our pores. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You just need to be in America in a of time and, and it's there, right? Yeah. It come through. Yeah. 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 And we have a just a little bit of time left, but I wanted to circle back on the question that I posed about 15 minutes ago, and that is, what, what, what could be a call to action or just a, a call to get involved? Yeah. A way for our viewers to um, help push this narrative forward, help um, help undo some of the erasure, right? Whatever part of you know your four different uh, distinct chapters or oh, right. Right. Uh, not chapters, but the views of the railroad. The railroad. What what is something practical? And you know, I just zeroed in on sort of you know all of those that lost their lives. Yeah no markings, no, no memory of people yeah. that literally gave their lives for right. something that, you know, a hundred and however many years later is still mm -hmm. here and we're using and through our pores. I mean, all of these things just kind of wrap this up for us. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that I have a, a good answer um, because I'm like a, someone who studies literature and culture. I'm always like, Educ like reading about these things, you know, um, just educating yourself and those mm -hmm. around you and being able to like, to, to sort of question the standard fare, the standard narrative that we're always spoon fed, you know, about what, you know, what it means to be American, our American history, our American past and looking for, you know, kind of other voices. Um, there's so much work that's on the historians have done, like African-American historians, um, folks who specialize in kind of Chicano Chicano history have done so much work uncovering archives, uncovering experiences around the railroad. And I think just being mindful um, of that and trying to seek some of that out, I think is really important. It's kind of hard because you bring up the example, Kathleen, of um, of unmarked graves, right? It's hard to memorialize something when there isn't a place or a thing you can go to, right? But you just mm -hmm. have this knowledge um, that many, 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 many thousands and thousands of men died um, building the, that that train, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's a difficult, it's a difficult question precisely for that reason, because we don't have one single place. We don't there isn't just one single thing that we can do. But I really believe, you know, when I talk about this with my students, I'm like, educate yourself about this, learn about it, and, and just question, ask questions. Like, why? Why is the train here? Like, what is the history of the railroad um, in my city or in my part of the country or w whatever it is, right? It can be the train. It can be anything. Um, but there are other stories out there. We just need to seek them out, Um and pass them along, you know, as much as we possibly can. I think that's that's a great practical uh, thing. Yeah, you know, yeah. right. Ed educate. I, I, mean, I believe it. I believe in the power of reading yeah. um, to expand our horizons and to to think about things outside, you know, outside the box. I really do. I wouldn't be an educator if I didn't. Essentially. Yeah. So you know, I think that that is. I think sometimes people want something really like dramatic or you know something, but I, I'm like just just follow yeah. up. Um, research, do do some reading on the subject. Yeah. And I think that is a huge step forward. Oh, I, I, it's yes, I agree. So everybody listening, you know, <laughs> let's continue this journey. Yeah, let's not let it end here with Julia tonight. Let's mm -hmm. educate ourselves. And I love I, the next train track. I'm going to actually like, why? Yeah, right yeah. Right? do a little bit of yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, Thank you. And I'm going to turn over to Kyla. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been a fantastic conversation. And Renee and I say this every time, but it's because it's true. It's not enough time. It was really not enough time. An hour is not enough, but it has been so wonderful to have you here, Julia. I will say everybody watching, this book is excellent. And I, I know I, I shouldn't ever confess what I do to books, but I'm going to do it because if you can see, there is so much here that I noted. I was so interested in and I folded down and I you know, all these highlights and things that are so fascinating. And so I really recommend 
that you get this book. Uh, it's one of the ways that you can support the people who come and uh, hang out with us, but also it's just a fantastic, interesting book. And as we talked about tonight, it's really important to how we look at our nation and how we relate to ourselves. You can get it at your favorite independent bookstore. I also put a link in the chat to NYU Press, which is the publisher. And you can also get it from our friends, the library system, pgcmls.info. They should be able to hook you up with it. Uh, and you can also go to them for a virtual library card if you're watching from outside of the region. Um, we have a bunch more events for you coming up. Uh, if you can go to our website, I put it on the screen earlier, civilrights.mypgc.us and click on the events tab. You'll see some wonderful things we have coming up, uh, including next week, we have an in-person author event on Tuesday and on Wednesday. We really want you to come out to the Logger Kettering Branch Library where we were doing a hate crimes forum with the Department of Justice, uh, the FBI, the uh, Prince George's County State's Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Prince George's County Police Department and our office, and we're really looking at how to identify and how to prevent hate crimes. So please come join us for that. Um, Dr. Lee, thank you so much for being with us. We are so grateful for your time. Um, it's just been absolutely wonderful. And we hope that we can have you back again soon. I would love it. Thank you all. Thank all right. you. Take thank care, everybody. You. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.